Hello, I'm Nicholas Tedesco Dio, Associate Program Director for the Good Samaritan Regional Medical Center and Samaritan Medical Group Orthopedic Surgery Residency Program in Corvallis, Oregon. Today I'll be presenting on primary total hip arthroplasty as part of our ongoing lecture series to supplement our in-class didactics. So we'll start off, as always, with disclosures. I do own stock in ROM Tech, which was formerly ROM3 Rehab, an orthopedic rehabilitation company. Uh, this affiliation has nothing to do with this talk. So as with any topic in orthopedics, the first thing we always have to start off with is anatomy. Much like with total knee arthroplasties, we've got to talk about femoral axes and angles. The typical femoral neck shaft angle is 135 degrees. Anything greater than this is coxa valga. Anything less than this is coxa vera. The typical femoral mechanical axis is 3 degrees off of the normal axis, which is the gravitational pull of the body, and 6 degrees from the anatomic axis. Therefore, the anatomic axis is 9 degrees off of the normal axis. Typical femoral neck antiversion with respect to the coronal plane is 15 degrees. The next thing we talk about in the proximal femur are the femoral trabeculae, or femoral trabecular intramedullary bone that aligns in response to typical stresses on the proximal femur. These are stress lines that are seen grossly on pathology and can be seen on x-ray as well. Ward's triangle is a relative hypodense region of this trabeculae right near the calcar in the intramedullary base of the neck that has a uh, poor amount of bone quality and stock in this area. That's a poor spot for purchase for femoral neck fixation of any implants or devices. The next thing we talk about are the sciatic notches of the pelvis, both the greater and the lesser. This comes down to rote memorization, really, where you have to remember these things. There are 11 structures that pass through the greater sciatic notch which is the area superior to the ischial spine, the lesser sciatic notch is inferior to the ischial spine. The purus formis muscle is one of the things that exits through the greater sciatic notch, and then memorizing which structures pass superior or inferior to this can be helpful, although obviously there's always a small amount of anatomic variation from patient to patient. The lesser sciatic notch typically has four structures, many of which came out through the greater sciatic notch and then are coming back into the pelvis through the lesser. So here's an image of that where the piriformis is coming out the greater sciatic notch. Here the sacrospinous ligament has been cut, the sacrotuberous ligament is intact, but the pudendal nerve, internal pudendal artery, and the nerve tractor internus all loop out over that sacrospinous ligament hence why they come out through the greater sciatic notch but come back in through the lesser. Blood supply of the hip really comes down to blood supply of the proximal femur. This is one of the most important topics and highly tested topics in all of orthopedics. In childhood, it's predominantly from the foveal and medial circumflex artery, and in adulthood, the predominant femoral head blood supply is from the medial femoral circumflex artery and the lateral epiphyseal arteries. So it starts off with both the femoral and obturator arteries as the lateral and medial blood supplies, respectively. So the obturator artery gives off the ligamentum teres femoris capitis artery, or the artery of the round ligament of the femoral head, which then gives off the foveal artery and then the medial epiphyseal vessels. Now on the femoral side, it's the profunda femoris artery that gives off the lateral circumflex and the medial circumflex. The lateral femoral circumflex artery gives off an ascending branch, which contributes anteriorly to the extracapsular arterial ring. The medial femoral circumflex artery gives off an ascending branch that contributes to the posterior extracapsular arterial ring that then anastomoses with the anterior portion around the level of the piriformis fossa. The extracapsular or basal cervical arterial ring then gives off ascending cervical artery branches, which then form the intracapsular or subcapital arterial ring as they enter the joint capsule itself. Here's an image of those particular contributions, where again you have the artery of the ligamentum teres medially, and then laterally you have this huge anastomotic network of the medial and lateral femoral circumflex vessels that are the branches of the profunda femoris.
Once you have those ascending cervical arteries becoming the intracapsular arterial ring, the retinacular arteries are then given off. These are in branches of inferior, superior, and anterosuperior. They are the principal feeders of the head and neck along with the lateral epiphyseal vessels from the intracapsular arterial ring, which also gives rise to the inferior epiphyseal vessels. The lateral epiphyseal artery is the terminal branch of the medial femoral circumflex. The most important is the superior retinacular arteries, which is the weight-bearing portion of the femoral head. It needs the most blood supply. So these are contained within the retinaculum of vibrect, a longitudinal fold in the hip capsule, and can bleed like crazy at the time of hip surgery during release. Next thing we'll talk about from an anatomic perspective is what's known as the acetabular zones, which is essentially a four-quadrant makeup of the acetabulum which helps determine screw placement during fixation or cup placement and total hip arthroplasty. It's based on two lines, one drawn from the anterior superior iliac spine through the center of the acetabulum, and the other is drawn perpendicular to that line, also through the center of the acetabulum. What this establishes is four different zones, the superior, anterosuperior, Posteroinferior and anteroinferior zones. The posterior superior zone is the safe zone. There's a small risk of hitting the sciatic nerve as you get posterior and inferior in this zone, but otherwise there's very little at risk if you were to inadvertently penetrate the inner table of the acetabulum or pelvis. The posterior inferior zone is the caution zone. It's generally safe if your screws are less than 20 millimeters in length. But as you can see on that image, your screws could protrude into the greater or lesser sciatic notches. So there are a lot of different vessels and nerves at risk if that were to happen, hence why you need to keep your screws short. The anterior inferior is the danger zone. This contains the obturator nerve and vessels, and the anterosuperior is the death zone. It contains the external iliac vessels. So in general, except in very complex situations, you want to avoid the anterior quadrants of the acetabulum because of what lies on the other side. And it is within millimeters, so even short screws sometimes can be very difficult to get into these zones. Now we'll talk about the anatomic approaches available for total hip arthroplasty. There are several other approaches that we're not going to discuss here, such as the super path approach or the two incision approach. But we'll start with the anterior supine intermuscular approach or the direct anterior or the minimally invasive approach. The eponym for this is the Smith-Peterson approach. It has many different uses, but is becoming more commonly used for primary total hip arthroplasty. It does not expose the acetabulum as well as other approaches unless muscles are extensively stripped. In general, it's also not really considered extensile, although there are extensile modifications that have been well described, including releasing the gluteal muscles off of the iliac crest to get more extension proximally and posteriorly. Also, you can curve the incision distally to become a lateral approach to the femur for longer approaches. The superficial plane is between the sartorius and tensor fascia lata. The superficial inner nervous plane is the femoral and superior gluteal nerves. The deep plane is between the rectus femoris and the gluteus medius. The inner nervous plane remains the same. The incision tends to be two centimeters inferior and lateral to the anterior superior iliac spine, aiming at the lateral border of the patella for about eight to 10 centimeters. And then you start to infiltrate those intermuscular and internervous planes that we just talked about. The sartorius is retracted proximally and medially throughout the case and the tensor fascia lata distally and laterally. If you need to, you can detach the iliac origin of the tensor fascia lata to develop the plane and extend it more proximally, but don't forget about the blood supply to the hip if what you're doing here is washing a hip out or performing internal fixation of a fracture. For a total hip replacement, the blood supply is largely irrelevant in terms of obviating avascular necrosis by no longer needing the femoral head. Again, the deep dissection, we talked about the inner nervous and intermuscular planes. This then exposes what's called the no-name fascia between the rectus femoris and the gluteal muscles. This is in size exposing a fatty layer on the capsule. And then the reflected head of the rectus femoris is resected off of the capsule, gaining full exposure to the anterior hip. 
If need be, you can release the iliopsoas medially if they have chronic tendinosis, tendinitis, or severe hip flexion contractor. Likewise, if they battle with chronic bursitis in the iliopsoas bursa, that can be addressed through this as well. However, as you progress more medially with this exposure and approach, you get closer to the femoral artery and vein, so care must be taken to avoid these, just superficial to where you're working. The dangers of this approach are the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve, which is cut and, and or damaged in about 80% of patients. About half of those will come back, so about 40% of patients will live life without sensation in their lateral femoral cutaneous nerve. The femoral nerve and artery, as we just talked about, if you extend too superficially and too medially, you could get into that. And then the ascending branch of the lateral femoral circumflex artery, which is usually ligated for total hip replacement, but can be a problem if you are preserving the femoral head. We just talked about the extensile different approaches, and I'll leave it to you to read this slide if need be. And that moves us on to the anterolateral or Watson-Jones approach. There are two options to position this. One is supine with the buttock up on a bump, and the other is fully laterally. So the incision to this is relatively similar to a posterior approach on the skin where you go along the long axis of the femur and then curve towards the posterior superior iliac spine. You want to find the vastus lateralis ridge as one of your landmarks because that's what's going to help gain your exposure anteriorly. The interval is intermuscular. It's the TFL and the gluteus medius, but both are innervated by the superior gluteal nerve, so there's no true internervous plane. You want to incise the fascia lata in line with its fibers to expose the underlying vastus lateralis and the vastus ridge. As you head superiorly towards the ASIS and inferiorly down the femoral shaft, that's what will extend this approach, both proximally and distally. You want to avoid making your incision too far anterior or the fascia will resist adduction and external rotation during reaming and you can fracture the femoral shaft, usually a spiral oblique fracture. You want to elevate the anterior fascial flap and detach the gluteus medius fibers that insert on the undersurface of this flap. You want to identify and develop the plane between the TFL and the gluteus medius. You do not want to develop the plane proximal to the origin of the muscles at the iliac crest because then the superior gluteal nerve and vessels enter the tensor fascia lata at this level and can be damaged. Here's an image of that where you're retracting the gluteus medius posteriorly and the tensor fascia lata anteriorly, which fully exposes the anterior capsule just in front of and anterior to the greater trochanter. And you can see the anterior surface of the femur here marked just distal to the vastus ridge with a small portion of the vastus lateralis detached at this level to gain full exposure to the base of the femoral neck. You can expose the femoral head and acetabulum in one of two ways. You can either perform a trochanteric osteotomy with later fixation after the closure of the case, and then you flip the gluteus medius up, or you can do a partial abductor release where you release a small portion of the gluteus medius if it can't be fully retracted out of the way. Here's an example of the trochanteric osteotomy that gains full exposure to the acetabulum and flips the gluteus medius out of the way. This can be an extensile approach extending down the entire lateral femur for full exposure um, and converting it to a coker langenbeck approach posteriorly for increased exposure of the pelvis and acetabulum. You can also undermine the gluteus medius, extending it anteriorly for an anterior augment if needed. Again, there's no inner nervous plane here. Both muscles that you're going between are fed by the superior gluteal nerve. The femoral nerve is the most lateral in the neurovascular bundle, so if you remember the NAVAL acronym of nerve, artery, vein, and lymphatics as you go from lateral to medial, that will tell you what's at risk as you continue to head in that direction. Overzealous external rotation during dislocation can spiral fracture the femoral shaft, and you may need to perform a double osteotomy of the neck to remove it first, followed by the head with a Steinman pin if it is difficult to dislocate. There is a minimally invasive version of the anterolateral approach using a much smaller incision. However, it has not been shown to actually improve gait parameters or decrease soft tissue complications. Patients at high risk for dislocation may benefit from this as opposed to a posterior approach because there's no posterior soft tissue disruption. 
and there is some concern that this approach can weaken the abductor mechanism, which can lead to poor offset, poor control, and increased dislocation, as well as limping uh, postoperatively from the weakness. However, in my experience, I found that most patients with an anterolateral approach will resolve the limp around one to one and a half years after surgery where they finally get strong enough again. It does have the highest risk of heterotopic ossification though with the Watson-Jones anterolateral compared to the other approaches. The dangers, the most common is compression neuropraxia caused by medial retraction of the femoral nerve. Direct injury can occur from placing a retractor into the psoas muscle. So you want to avoid this and be careful Likewise, the femoral artery is not far from that, so you want to avoid the psoas if possible because that's where you get close to those things. The abductor limp is another problem, but a good closure here and restoration of the abductor mechanism as well as appropriate rehabilitation can obviate that. Finally, femoral shaft fracture, so be careful with your management of the fascia and with over-exuberant dislocation. The direct lateral or Harding approach, which is uh, the more commonly used and more commonly quoted anterolateral approach used in the United States today, or rather a modification thereof, but essentially it's a lateral recumbent and utilizes many of the same principles and landmarks as the Watson-Jones approach. The incision is very similar to the Watson-Jones, and the internervous plane is the gluteus medius and the vastus lateralis. So now you have the superior gluteal nerve and the femoral nerve that are being infiltrated. So there is a true internervous plane here. So here you can see the fascia lata is split longitudinally, exposing the tendon of the gluteus medius as it inserts on the greater trochanter. You retract the fascia very similarly and split the gluteus medius in line with its fibers beginning in the middle of the trochanter, extending three centimeters above it, and then you will release that anterior third of the gluteus medius off of the trochanter. You want to tag that for later closure, and the closure of that is going to be crucial to your outcome. The advantage here is it doesn't remove the entire gluteus medius as in the Watson-Jones. So here's showing how that is split along with the vastus lateralis in line. Again, you detach the gluteus minimus and trochanteric attachment to the anterior portion of the greater troch and retract it with the anterior portion of the vastus and gluteus medius anteriorly until the hip capsule is fully exposed. The gluteus minimus does blend in with the hip capsule, so portions of this may need to be released. However, my preferred technique is to keep it intact and repaired and mass at the end of the case with the capsule. So here's an example of that where the anterior third of the gluteus medius has been removed off of the greater trochanter in line with the vastus lateralis. However, the modification of this is where you actually split the tendon and you do not undermine the vastus lateralis like in this picture. That fully exposes the minimus and capsule underneath and allows you to incise that at the basal cervical portion of the neck. And then you extend that in line with the fibers of the gluteus minimus as your L-shaped incision of the capsule to gain full exposure at the joint. Dangers here are the superior gluteal nerve, again with too proximal of dissection, especially through the gluteus medius. The femoral nerve, and very similar to the Watson-Jones approach, as you head medial and superficial, you will get into it. Same thing with the femoral artery and vein. And then finally, the transverse branch of the lateral femoral circumflex artery. That's what you've got to watch out for if you're not performing a total hip replacement where you're trying to preserve the femoral head blood supply. Extension can be extended distally and similar to approximately more that you would have to extend it posteriorly or undermine the gluteus minimus, but you can only go so far before you get into the nerve and artery pedicle to it. This does avoid the need for a trochanteric osteotomy because the bulk of the gluteus medius is preserved. It does allow for earlier mobilization and probably better gait mechanics with less limp, uh, but it is a narrower exposure than the anterolateral approach, so it's not the best choice for revision surgeries. Now for the posterior approach, which is sort of the workhorse for revision surgery and still one of the most common approaches performed for primary total hip arthroplasty in the United States. The other names for it are the southern or more approach. Patients in the true lateral position, similar incisions following the long axis of the femur and then curving towards the posterior superior iliac spine. Once you do that, you incise the fascia lata over the lateral femur in line with its fibers, splitting it along with the gluteus maximus 
which allows full exposure of the short external rotators, the vastus lateralis, and the gluteus medius. So here is that skin incision along with the fascial incision into the fascia lata, and you can see the vastus lateralis distally and then the gluteus maximus proximally. You're going to retract the gluteus and deep fascia of the thigh, exposing the fat over the short external rotators, which you will then release off the proximal femur. There are some people who describe preserving the attachment of the piriformis where they put their retractor under that and retract it superiorly throughout the case. I myself incise it because I find that it may in fact be a pain generator after surgery to preserve it. However, that is certainly debatable. You want to put stay sutures into it for closure at the end if so desired and usually a T-shaped capsulotomy or an L-shaped and you want to tag that for later closure because in the posterior approach closure of the capsule has been shown to lower the dislocation risk. So here is a close-up example of that with your short external rotators and the quadratus femoris. You do not want to get into the quadratus because that's where your sciatic nerve it lies on the back side of that and is being protected. So if you're getting into the quadratus, you might be getting into the nerve. Similar picture, just showing how you incise those and retract them out of the way, which will gain full exposure to the capsule just deep to those short external rotators. So this is an extensile approach, can be extended into the coker lingenbreck approach to the posterior acetabulum. It also can be extended as far down the femoral shaft as need be. Again, there's no inner nervous plane in this with the gluteus maximus being the inferior gluteal nerve is split in line with its fibers well distal to its innervation. Dangers are the sciatic nerve as we just talked about, so leave the quadratus femoris. Likewise, dislocating this can be problematic if it's very tight. You can create a spiral oblique fracture of the femur, so be very careful on that aspect. Proper gentle retraction and release short external rotators posteriorly to protect the sciatic nerve. The first perforating branch of the profunda femoris artery is at risk. Again, not a big deal in total hip replacement. Same thing, femoral vessels are at risk only if you over exuberantly plunge your retractors on your anterior acetabulum. And the quadratus femoris, we talked about that excessive retraction there, can damage the sciatic nerve. Additionally, it can involve the medial femoral circumflex artery as it comes around the backside of the femur right above the quadratus. So the superior hip approach is a relatively newer approach, which is essentially the proximal portion of the posterior hip approach. So it's a much smaller and basically a minimally invasive version of the posterior approach, where the incision is along the superior or buttock aspect of that posterior incision, and the gluteus maximus fibers are split. It does preserve much more of the iliotibial band, and it preserves a little bit more soft tissue, which may lower the risk of dislocation postoperatively. So here's an example of all of the different approaches. This superior approach, also used in what's called the super path approach, uh, which is a right medical specific um, implant system. Uh, but you can see the different location of all of these different approaches on that image. You can see in this image in the upper right, all you're doing is splitting fibers of the gluteus maximus to gain exposure of the hip joint from superior. Extension of this approach will just become the posterior approach to the hip. Dangers obviously are the sciatic nerve on the back side of the hip there with similar reasoning as the posterior approach. So finally we've dealt with the anatomy. Now we have to talk about implant considerations whenever it comes to total hip arthroplasty. So any discussion of implant considerations has to come with a history of where we've been and how we got to where we are. So the history of hip arthroplasty starts in 1891 with German surgeon Themistocles Gluck, who performed an ivory hip hemiarthroplasty for avascular necrosis. In 1925, Marius Smith Peterson developed a glass resurfacing which fit over the femoral head, which was smooth and inert. However, as you can imagine, shattering became quite a problem. In 1938, London surgeon Philip Lyles performed the first successful total hip replacement using a stainless steel joint that was attached to bone with bolts and screws, but loosening became a big problem with all of the stresses at the joint. In 1970, a ceramic component was first used, but first-generation ceramics fractured readily and were a big problem. 
in the mid-1970s, George McKee began performing the metal-on-metal -metal monoblock components that actually did quite well, but metallosis was an issue, which then enabled the advent of polyethylene to finally be used in the late 1970s. Here's just a few images of both the cemented and the press fit, uh, different implant designs over the years, extending all the way back to the history of hip implants. Likewise, here are all the different designs that have been tried and many of which have failed over the years for the total hip replacement implant. So once you figure out which implant you want to use, you have to take into consideration implant fixation. There's two methods, cemented or biologic interdigitation. Another name for that we call is pressurized fit or press fit. The trend is going towards uncemented due to the failure risk of cemented implants, especially in young and active patients, because eventually the cement will crack or debond from the implants, whereas the goal of pressurized fit is to get biologic ingrowth such that they may last the rest of the patient's lifetime. So cement fixation is referred to as interlocking fit. It involves a mechanical interlock of the polymethyl methacrylate to the bone. It's a static interference fit with limited remodeling potential. It will crack with cyclic loading and will not remodel and eventually fail. Cement has stronger fixation in osteopenic bones secondary to the deeper cement penetration. It's preferred for irradiated bone because it does not rely on any bone ingrowth potential. The indications in total hip replacement tend to be on the femoral side only with very limited indications on the acetabular side again mostly for irradiated bone. The acetabular cemented components tend to fail at a high rate because of high shearing and rotational stresses. Risk of cardiac events, however, do exist with cementation when it is pressurized. We do see a result in massive hypotension and you can also get embolic phenomenon to the point where this can be deadly in patients intraoperatively. So you must be careful with this. Whenever I am cementing or pressurizing cement, I do alert the anesthesiologist and I make sure our FiO2 is up to 100% and that our fluids are running wide open for pressure support. Cement polymerization can generate temperatures up to 100 degrees Celsius ex vivo and 50 degrees Celsius in vivo. Cell death occurs right around there, so if it is getting too hot, it can actually cause local necrosis. So when we talk about cement fixation, we've come a long way in developing this as well. So first generation fixation techniques involved a hand mix of the cement open to air. It was finger packed into the canal with no canal preparation or a cement restrictor placed. Second generation now had the cement gun that we use today with the femoral canal prepped with a brush and dried and then a cement restrictor placed to enhance the pressurization of the cement and therefore interdigitation with the remaining bone. Third generation now involves vacuum mixing which reduces porosity and increases the strength and longevity of the cement. It involves cement pressurization and it involves extensive canal prep including pulse lavage and again the cement restrictor placed. Cement fixation is optimized to limit porosity of the cement, hence the vacuum tube that we now use. You want at least a two millimeter thick mantle surrounding the entire component. There's an increased risk of mantle fracture if it's too thick and an increased risk of debonding if it's too thin. The stiffer the stem, the increased Young's modulus, the more likely it is to cause cement cracking. You want to avoid cement mantle defects, which are just defects in the cement as it bonds to the equipment and to the bone. These are going to be things like air bubbles or blood or fat interposed. Likewise, it's going to be things like cracking, especially if you cement an implant and then something happens and you try to drill through it to place screws, you can cause cracking of the cement. Biologic fixation, or the so-called press fit, is a dynamic interface with the potential for bone remodeling and lifelong bond. Methods of biologic fixation include the porous coating on the metallic surfaces, which allows for bone ingrowth, grit blasted surfaces, which increase the surface area that allow for bone on growth, and then hydroxyapatite coating, which acts as an osteoconductive agent to use as an adjunct for porous and grit blasted components. 
It promotes more rapid closure of the gaps and it promotes time to biologic fixation, although this has shown no specific advantage in humans. There is a potential that hydroxyapatite coating delaminates from the surface and therefore will loosen the fixation of the component. And the success does depend on the crystallinity and optimal thickness of the coating, which is 50 micrometers. So the extent of the porous coating, you want proximal porous coating for less distal stress shielding, extensively porous coating used in periprosthetic fractures or revisions will likely have stress shielding. Basically, proximal porous coating is only around the metaphyseal component and the extensive porous coating goes all the way down the shaft. The problem with stress shielding is wherever the implant gets its first fixation in bone distally is where the bone will transfer loads to the implant. What happens then is you get what's called a spot weld where the bone thickening is increased because of the increased stresses at that point, but any bone proximal to that is shielded by stress because all the stress is transferred to the implant. So you can develop severe osteoporosis in the proximal part of the femur despite a robust bone quality and bone stock distally, which can lead to fractures of the trochanteric area in the future. So optimals of porous coating include pore size of around 50 micrometers, porosity of 50%, gaps less than 50 micrometers, and micromotion less than 50 to 100 micrometers. So this is known as the rule of 50s. If you remember 50, that should get you most of these answers. You must have initial rigid fixation. If it's too loose and the implant is toggling, pistoning, or windshield wipering, bone ingrowth and ongrowth will not occur, and instead you will get fibrous ingrowth. Eventually you'll end up with a periprosthetic fracture and severe pain. You want to obtain cortical contact in order to do this to gain full interdigitation of the implant. Stress shielding we just talked about because of the redistribution of load and stress on a bone. It's due to Wolf's Law with osteolysis occurring from atrophy and distal stem fixation from the lack of stress on the bone proximally. Higher stress shielding is seen in larger diameter stems, stems that are stiffer, the geometric shape of the stem, whether or not it's extensive porously coated, and whether or not the patient had greater preoperative osteopenia to begin with. Clinical complications of stress shielding are largely unknown with the exception of the risk of fracture as they become more osteoporotic proximally. You will see a spot weld as we talked about at the tip of the extensive porous stems or basically wherever that load is abruptly transferred to the implant. So here's an example of a patient immediately postoperatively on the left and then seven years later on the right. You can see the hypertrophy, thickening, and increased calcium deposition at the spot weld and then the relative stress shielding with osteopenia proximal to that. So when it comes to choosing between press fit or cementation, there is some things we can look at that can help and the door classification is one of these. It's the degree of bone integrity of the femur which helps predict fracture risk if you're press fitting an implant. It's a complex ratio of the canal at the lesser trochanter to the diaphyseal isthmus but a sort of cheat sheet way that I do or a quick easier one to apply is that the door type A is the normal proximal taper with a thick cortex of the diaphyseal bone. Essentially, the sum of the cortices is greater than the medullary diameter at the isthmus. Type B is where you have a decreased proximal taper with a thin cortex where the sum of cortices is less than the medullary canal at the isthmus. A type C is the loss of the proximal taper entirely with a very thin cortex and what's called a stovepipe or capacious canal with a very wide isthmus. So here's an example of those thick cortices seen on the A, the relatively thinner on the B, but the intact proximal taper up into the trochanteric and calcar regions. And then in the door C, you have that very wide capacious canal with no proximal taper going into the trochanteric region or up into the calcar. So type A, press fit for sure. Type B, dealer's choice. Type C, maybe consider cementation. High risk of fracture with press fits. High incidence of thigh pain with press fits because of the circumferential fixation with a much wider area and larger implant. Additionally, there's a high risk of subsidence because a lot of people in a door C femur will back off on their impaction strength because they don't want to fracture the femur. So instead what they do is they leave it 
too proud or they actually undersize the implant and then postoperatively the patient will subside and fracture. So now we're on to our implant options in terms of metallurgy and their makeup. So you have cobalt chromium versus titanium. Cobalt chromium is strong and better resistant to corrosion than stainless steel. It generates small amount of metal debris and it's resistant to surface wear. Titanium is very biocompatible and resistant to corrosion similar Young's modulus to cortical bone, but generates large amounts of metal debris. However, these are inert compared to the cobalt and chromium, which are toxic. It has poor resistance to wear because it has notch sensitivity. As a result, titanium should never be used as a femoral head where it's in a high stress and load bearing environment. However, titanium is better for fixation in the bone because it's not as stiff as cobalt chromium, which will fracture the bone at greater amounts or create spot weld and stress shielding in greater amounts. Additionally, the cobalt chromium has a small amount of nickel in it, which can be a problem with patients with metal allergies. This leads to the use of titanium femoral stems or ceramic or auxinium femoral heads. The next thing you want to talk about is a monoblock versus a modular component. So monoblock components were developed by Dr. John Charn Lee in the 1970s. They're still in wide use today and do have a great track record. They're great because it's one piece. The femoral stem and femoral head are all one piece, one size. The problem with this is that there's no ability to customize things. If it's not stable, you can't lengthen the neck. You can't change your version. You can't modify the location of the implant. It's sort of one size fits all or else. And so it, it, it has become a problem. However, the modular stems do have problems with micromotion at the junctions where you get fretting, corrosion, metallosis, fractures, things like that. Finally, you have this newer stem called a microplasty stem, which is a much smaller version of a femoral stem. So it's a reduced distal stem length and diameter. It's developed to prevent catching in distal stems in door A bone, where you have those thick diaphyseal cortexes, where when you're impacting an implant, it could pot into that long before it's fully seated. So this bypasses that. It also allows for easier insertion during the anterior supine approach because exposure of the femur is limited. These smaller stems have been associated with lower intraoperative complications, including trochanteric avulsions and femoral fractures. They are easier insertion. More research needs to be done for long-term survival, but short-term studies are promising in terms of their survivability, perhaps being better than conventional stems because there's not as much distal bone contact and stress shielding. Standard stem sizes are still being used and do have a good long-term track record as well. So there's really no disadvantage to them either. The big question about these smaller ones is do they lead to increased groin and thigh pain because of their impaction and fitting more proximally? and that remains to be fully elucidated in the literature. So here's an example of some of those options where you have the hip resurfacing only on the far left, something like the Birmingham hip resurfacing procedure, then you have that microplasty stem in the middle, and then your standard conventional stem on the right. Then on the acetabular side, we've got to talk about acetabular constraint, and this is the means of preventing dislocation following hip replacement because of the sacrifice of stabilizing ligaments. So we rely on the soft tissue tensions and the muscular tension after the surgery to hold the hip in the socket, but to some extent we can control that by adjusting our version on the femoral side of things and the position on the acetabular side. And if we still can't, then we can start to manipulate the acetabular liner to help us out. So the standard liner or the neutral liner is the least constraining. A face changing liner is usually a 10 degree. So if you put your cup in 50 degrees of vertical positioning and you don't like it and it's not stable but you don't want to take the cup all the way back out, you can change the face by 10 degrees which will then make your polyethylene have a 40 degree abduction angle. If that still doesn't work then you can go to an offset or lateralized liner where it builds it out of the acetabular cup to increase your offset which also will slightly increase your leg lengths. Finally, you can go to a lipped or elevated liner where there's a large elevated surface on one side only and you dial that in to where they want to come out, which just increases the jump distance, which is the distance that the femoral head has to travel in order to dislocate. The higher the jump distance, the more likely it is to stay stable. 
finally, if none of that works, then you can go to a fully constrained liner, as illustrated on this image right here, where the metal ring is placed over the femoral neck, then the femoral neck is reduced into this femoral head inside the cup, and then the ring is placed over the top of that to prevent dilation of the plastic liner that allows that inner head to freely rotate inside there, but will not allow it to jump out of the plastic cup. So now we're on to tribological considerations, which is essentially the study of two mating surfaces in motion, so the bearing surfaces. So when it comes to those, we've got to talk about metal on polyethylene, metal on metal, ceramic on polyethylene, and ceramic on ceramic. So metal, which is usually a cobalt chromium head on polyethylene, has the longest track record. It's the lowest cost. It probably has the most modularity, and you can increase your neck length longer than you can with ceramics. However, the disadvantage is, is it does have a higher wear rate compared to metal on metal and ceramic on ceramic which means you'll wear through the polyethylene a little bit faster than the hard bearings. You must use smaller heads than a metal-on-metal -metal articulation, which theoretically a larger head increases the jump distance again, so less likelihood of dislocating, whereas with these, perhaps more likelihood of dislocation. However, there's a new concern now for metal-on-metal -metal head taper corrosion and metal-on-metal -metal debris problems, or what's called trunnionosis, at the junction between the head and the neck. So perhaps ceramic on polyethylene is the answer, especially now that metal on metal has fallen out of favor in terms of the bearing surface. So metal cobalt chromium on metal cobalt chromium, aka metal on metal, does have several advantages. It's low cost, allows for larger heads and decreased dislocation, and no polyethylene to wear out, so it will increase longevity. However, the big disadvantage to this, that this sounded great in theory but turned out poor in practice, was the metallic debris that was generated by these surfaces were locally and systemically toxic. They could cause cardiotoxicity, CNS toxicity, and thyrotoxicity, as well as local adverse local tissue reactions, or these so-called pseudotumors. Therefore, these are no longer used because they have become such a destructive phenomenon. So the adverse local tissue reaction or the aseptic lymphocytic vasculitis associated lesions or the alval lesions are a local immune response to the metallic debris. The other name is pseudotumor. As you can see on these MRIs, they create this huge tumor-like proliferation of inflammatory and metal debris that presents similar to a soft tissue sarcoma. The problem with this is this immune response dissolves everything in its path, including bone and soft tissue. So you will get loosening, fractures, and instability problems from lack of soft tissue constraint. A MARS or a metal artifact reduction sequence MRI and serum cobalt and chromium levels are what we utilize to evaluate to see if this is in fact what's going on or we're seeing excessively elevated levels of cobalt and chromium. Uh, much of this will be discussed in other lectures this year. So for the bearing surfaces, now we're back to, um, instead of the polyethylene, hard bearing surfaces, so ceramic on ceramic. The advantage is, is this has the best wear properties of all, and they're totally inert. So the ceramic doesn't cause the, the local or systemic problems that metal does. The big disadvantage is this is incredibly expensive. It has the worst mechanical properties because of the brittleness, and so you can see fracture of these components, which is an obligate revision surgery. The other big thing is less modularity of neck length options because as you go to higher neck lengths, you'll decrease the amount of fixation between the trunnion and the ceramic, which can actually lead to fracture because of point loading. One other bizarre complication with this that does exist to some extent with the other bearings, but more so with this, is squeaking of the implant. And so I included a link here for another YouTube video that I would encourage you to watch because it is significant. Finally, another unique wear property of this is what's called stripe wear, usually where you get point loading, usually as a result of a vertical cup where you preferentially significantly wear only a certain portion of the femoral head where there's point contact and loading. So then we have ceramic versus metal on polyethylene. Recent literature has shown there's less wear debris with ceramic. 
The question of cost effectiveness comes into play because ceramics are more expensive than metal. Does an older patient need the added expense of ceramic when metal on polyethylene does have acceptable wear rates, especially in that population? However, many studies still show clinical benefit and cost benefit to ceramic heads, even in octogenarians. Some will use an age-based model for selecting femoral head surface. Older than 70 to 75 may get cobalt chromium. Younger patients get ceramic, but this is sort of dealer's choice. Surgeons must also consider the chronologic age and the activity level of the patients. Finally, just like in total knee replacement, there is computer-assisted orthopedic surgery as well as robotic-assisted surgery. Same issues where they're helpful to some extent. We can reproduce the anatomy better, but what we don't fully understand is what is accurate anatomy in total hips because of the complex interplay between spinal pelvic mechanics, making optimal cup position almost impossible to determine with our current knowledge and technology. The other issue with these is they are very expensive. They do add a series of fiddle factor to the case. So in general, they, they aren't as well adopted, especially with anterior hip approaches now being able to utilize fluoroscopy for optimal positioning. So much like in total knee arthroplasty, once you have your plan, you've got your preoperative assessment of the patient. So hip osteoarthritis is, again, a non-inflammatory type of arthritis. It's the most common form of arthritis. In 2011, 28 million people in the U.S. were estimated to have diagnosed osteoarthrosis, and I'm sure there are many others that have it undiagnosed. Other common causes of hip joint destruction include avascular necrosis and post-traumatic arthrosis. As of 2018, around 400,000 total hip arthroplasties are performed each year in the United States. So you have your patient picked, your implant picked, your approach picked, what's next? So again, preoperative discussions, mortality rate is about 0.75% at one year, so we've got to discuss risk factors and risk factor mitigation. Total hip replacements do carry with them a 98% satisfaction rate compared to only about 85% satisfaction rate in total knee replacements. So this is an excellent surgery. Anticoagulation should be considered because of the risk of VTE complications. Again, many options, but aspirin seems to be satisfactory in low-risk patients. Common complications need to be discussed with patients, which may be dependent on the approach that's being taken, but also other things like leg length discrepancy or rotational deformity, depending on adjustments with antiversion of the neck or cuff. So for preoperative planning, you want to get your standing AP pelvis, standing AP hip, cross table or frog leg lateral, and full femur if suspected deformity or old trauma or presence of distal implants that may impact your surgical plan. Adverse outcomes, uh, pretty much identical to total knee replacement, all of these things representing risk factors and the highlighted ones representing the greatest risk factors for adverse event. Absolute contraindications include non-compliance, especially with any precautions that need to be done postoperatively. BMI greater than 50, that should be mitigated. Hemoglobin A1C greater than 8, and some studies say greater than 7, should be mitigated prior to considering surgery and continuous tobacco abuse because of their modifiable risk. So risk mitigation, you have to identify the patient's modifiable risk factors and reduce them, and that includes things like dietary modifications, weight loss, different medications, change in medications, additional medications, a CPAP machine if obstructive sleep apnea is identified, you know, making sure you're managing, treating these things, and trying to actually even reverse them prior to surgery. Many studies have now shown that this is effective in reducing their surgical risk as well as being cost effective overall to do these interventions first. Additionally, neuraxial and regional anesthesia decreases early complications and length of hospital stay. Periarticular injection and 24 hours of IV steroids also has decreased early complications and improved pain control. And then finally, blood sparing techniques during surgery, including tranexamic acid to help minimize the risk of blood loss and transfusion need. So that concludes the total hip arthroplasty presentation. So I'll leave you with this image of Seattle's Japanese garden as my pitch for Pacific Northwest Pride. Reach out to me at any time if you have any questions, comments, or concerns. Thanks for your time.